as I mentioned yesterday, this house can be a prayer house, worship house, and a training house. So it is good to be here with you, starting a new day. I believe God has many blessings to share to each one of us. Uh, let's remember again that we are family. I say that because always there is a temptation to treat people from the GC like angels. Uh, we are sinners like you. The same honor, the same appreciation, the same respect that maybe I deserve from you, you should offer to your local church members. Nobody is more special in this church. We have different functions, not different positions. We have different functions. Somebody should be the union president, or the union or departmental leaders, conference presidents. We need those people. We need pastors. We need elders. We need deacons and deaconesses. But before God's eyes, we are all sinners. We need his grace. We need to fight for our salvation. So let's be kind. Let's be respectful to each one. Uh, in order to live a life like Jesus. Do you know, <clears throat> the biggest challenge in Christian life, it is not to be a better Christian, it's not to be a better pastor, or to be more faithful member in this congregation. The biggest challenge in Christian life is to be more like Jesus. When we become more like Jesus, We'll see more unity. We'll see a loving environment among us. And everything will be good. For example, if this church is the body of Christ, all plans that we make, all church initiatives that we prepare should reflect the life, the ministry, and the mission of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus spent a few times in church. His ministry was outside of the church. But nowadays, we spend more time in church trying to do ministry or outreach, but we are not reaching the community outside, around us. And the church is becoming a kind of spiritual club. We come to worship God, to sing, to give our offerings, and we go back to live the rest of the week, and many times without communion with God. So Jesus went to the synagogue. He sat, he read, but after that, he went out to reach and to reclaim his community. So we should do the same. We should do the same. The message today topic is there how to increase church resource. But let me read this Bible verse. I like it because it teaches me something very precious, something very important. The Bible is very clear. Don't say. Don't speak. Don't comment. Where, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. Many times in the church we have members who have a lot of nostalgia regarding the past. The past was better than today. Our pastors in the past was, were better than today. The preaching in the past were better than today. The music in the church in the past were better than today. The members are more consecrated in the past than the members today. Well, if the past was so good, why Jesus didn't come during that time? I believe the best moment of our church is before us. And you are not here for casualty. You are here because you receive a call from God. And you have a ministry to fulfill. In America, people used to say, how, how are you? And some of them, they say, well, better than yesterday and worse than tomorrow. 
because tomorrow it will be better than today. So this should reflect the, the church life. We are better than yesterday, but worse than tomorrow, because tomorrow will be better than today. Remember one point. This church was born to grow, to go forward. When I say that, I'm saying that the church should grow numerically. The church should grow spiritually. The church should grow geographically. The church should grow in knowledge. And the church should grow in finances. Now, when you think about a good pastor, what is your definition? Maybe you can say, for me, a good pastor is the one who preaches well, is the one who build good relationship with the church members, is the one maybe who is visiting the congregation. I think it's a, it's a good definition. But if I ask you, if this kind of pastor is leading one congregation that is facing financial challenges, where there is no money for the basic needs, do you still think that pastor is a good pastor? I believe, brothers and sisters, that a good leader, a good pastor, he can make the difference in his congregation. I'm saying that because I see in many places the church is facing financial limitation. It's so sad. The church has no money to pay the bills. The church has no money to, to decorate the congregation. The church has no money to provide good resources to the departments, children ministries, and Sabbath school for evangelism, and so forth. When leaders of the local congregation, they come to the church treasure and say, my dear brother, I need some money to buy some important resources for my department. The only words that the treasurer of the church used to say is, I'm so sorry, there is no money. There is no money. And some treasurers, they are so nice. They speak these words smiling. <laughs> Look, brother, unfortunately, no money, no money. And we, when we start listening this kind of comment, we start creating our church a kind of culture of poverty. And that's not good. I don't believe that we have a poor church. What I believe is maybe we have a poor administration or leadership in that congregation. Let me make here a kind of distinction between a poor church and a simple or modest church. A poor church has money for nothing. They are always complaining with the financial limitation. There is no leadership who set a good vision on how to increase the church in finance. But in the simple and modest church, we have the basic resource for the basic needs of the congregation. Let me be a little bit more clear. If you are pastoring a poor congregation, you are not representing the Seventh-day Adventist church. You are not representing God because our God is a God who abounds in riches. Let me make clear also that God loves the poor, but God hates poverty. Why in many congregations we don't have enough money? Lack of instructions. Pastors are not preaching about this topic. Stewardship or fidelity or generosity. When pastors or elders are visiting church members, they don't talk about faithfulness. 
And there are a lot of members in our congregation that are not faithful. And we are responsible for their spiritual life. As the message that Pastor Spencer or somebody mentioned previously, if you don't admonish those people, we are, com we are committed to them with their mistakes. So, teach our elders. When we give Bible studies, we need to talk about faithfulness, fidelity, tithes, offerings, and so forth. Remember, the church is a mirror of our leadership. If something is not doing well in our church, we are, at the end, responsible for that kind of situation. Now, I would like to help you today on how to increase in at least 30% the offerings in your church in the next Sabbath. You don't need to waste time to implement what I'm going to share with you. What I'm going to share with you is very simple. Maybe you already know, but I would like to remind you because we have a problem in this item, brothers and sisters. There are many churches where members during the offering time, they are giving coins left over, alms, like we give some money to the beggars. And pastors, elders, they see this kind of situation and they do nothing. Blind leadership. A couple was returning from the church with a small little boy. And while they are walking together, the husband started making some kind of criticism to the pastor's sermon in that day. The wife took the advantage to start criticizing the choir of the church. And the little boy was listening. And in one moment, the little boy looked at his father and said, Daddy, for that one dollar bill that you gave as an offering, do you expect a better program? <laughs> we are the church. Don't expect to receive from the church what you are not putting or offering to the church. Many times I see wrong motivations emphasized in our congregations. Extortion, Fear, people that they try to create a kind of guilt feeling when they talk about finance or other approaches. A, a church pastor was facing very challenging uh, limitation about finances in his church and he decided to make the offering announcement. So he came to the congregation and he said like this, brothers and sisters, now it's time to collect the offerings, but before the deacons start doing that, I'm, I have an announcement. There is a man in this church who is married, who is flirting with another mar married woman in this congregation. If this man does not give today uh, $10 as an offering, I'm going to read his name publicly. <laughs> At the end of the service, when the pastors were checking the basket of offering, he was surprised. More than 20 bills of $10. And he was more surprised when he saw a $5 bill with a short note, Pastor, Today I have only five. Please wait until next week. Don't read my name. Do you think this is a good approach? I heard in another church, the deacons are almost finishing the collection of the offerings when four men masked, using guns, weapons, declare assault. And they announce, who reacts we are going to kill? All men in the church stay paralyzed. 
The children start crying. The old people start fainting. The robbers took the money from the hands of the deacons and some handbags of the ladies, and they ran out, taking the pastor's wives as rest hostage. The pastor came very quickly to the pulpit and said, calm down, brothers and sisters, calm down. What you have seen a few seconds ago was just an illustration that I prepared for this service. <laughs> just to show you how sad, how drastic is to robe God in tithes and in offerings. <laughs> it's a crazy approach. In another church, a pastor came to the congregation and he said, brothers and sisters, I have one bad news to share with you today, but I have also a good news. But unfortunately, another bad news. So the first bad news is we need to change the roof of our church. It's too old. The good news is that the church has enough money to do that. So don't be concerned, relax. The bad news is that the money is still in your package. <laughs> so we are going to ask the deacons now to collect the offerings. <laughs> what is the right motivation? Much of the money that finds its way in the church could be called as collection rather than offering. Possibly because needs are more emphasized rather than the privilege of expressing love and gratitude to God. In my country, we have many church denominations. Most of those Pentecostal church, evangelical church, the membership knows the offerings the tithes that are collected go straight to the package of the local pastor. And do you know? They are faithful. But in our church, where we try to follow the biblical principles in applying the tithes and using the offerings, our members are not so faithful. What's going on, brothers and sisters? Do we need a real revival and reformation among us? Let me share a few practical tips. Number one, very simple. Those people that you are inviting to come to the platform, especially the one who is going to make the announcement, should be the best person you are selecting to participate during the worship service. After sermon, the most important, the most difficult part to perform is the announce of the offering. But many times we do not pay attention in this detail. What makes the difference between a good pastor and an ordinary pastor? The good pastor is always putting attention in the details in order to improve, in order to make the difference. I was in one church. The elder was there. Uh, sharing the responsibilities. And he said, Pastor Jonas, you are going to deliver the sermon, okay, I know, and, and the final benediction, okay, uh, it will be a pleasure to do that. But I was paying attention, who is going to be selected to announce the offering? He looked at another person who could speak well, good look, and he said, my brother, you are going to do the pastoral prayer. I, I don't know why we emphasize this pastoral prayer. Uh, prayer is a universal function. Everybody can pray, but it's not everybody who can make the offering announcement. He looked at another person and said, hey, you are going to announce the first hymn. And he looked at to a lady who was very shy, and he said, then you are going to announce the offering. The lady was scared. Me? What, what, what am I going to say? Well, read Malachi 3.10, it's okay. <laughs> and the lady came to the pulpit and made the announcement. Poor announcement. What is the result? Poor collection. In another place, a person, new member in the church, was invited to come to the platform. 
and they assigned him to announce the offering. He was very nervous. What am I going to say? He started memorizing something to announce during that special moment. And when he came close to the microphone and he looked at the congregation, he forgot everything that he had planned to say. The only words that came out from his mouth was, brothers and sisters, now the tithes are going to collect the offerings. <laughs> Heavy <Have> mercy. <laughs> I was on vacation in one congregation. And somebody recognized me and say, Pastor Jonas, you are here. Please come with us to the platform. Sometimes we need to go to the platform to be like a decoration. But that's OK. Everything is distributed now. But let's see what you can do, Pastor. OK, OK, OK. After collecting the offerings, could you lead a prayer of gratitude for the offerings and for the donors? I said, for sure. So I was paying attention. Who is going to announce the offering? Normally, when I visit some church, I know if the pastor is good or not good. Only when I see they selecting who is going to announce the offering. So a guy stood up and said, now it's time for the collection of the offerings and the deacons will uh, start collecting. May God bless you. Poor announcement. And the deacons went to collect the offerings. They are walking through the corridor, and almost nobody was giving offering during that time. When they came back, I stood up to pray. I look at the baskets. They are empty. And I said to the congregation, brothers and sisters, I'm not the pastor of this church. I'm only here visiting, but I'm invited to pray for the offerings. But the baskets are empty. I don't know what to do. Do you know what does it mean to worship God? Do you understand that when we come to worship God, we offer, and the offering time is a very important moment, not only to put money in the basket, but to, to put our lives, surrender our lives. By the way, I'm not speaking here as a stewardship director. It's not my intention to present the spiritual theology of the stewardship. I'm just, as a pastor, sharing some tips on how to improve some aspects of our lifestyle in the local congregation. And I said to the lady who was playing the piano, could you play the piano again, my dear? I'm going to send back the deacons again. <laughs> and now they are going to put the basket in your hands. And you will feel if the basket is full or empty. <laughs> After a few minutes, the deacons came back. I look at the baskets. They are overflowing of money. Is the church poor? Or the leadership is? In my church, I pay attention in the details. When I go to the pastoral room, I ask those people who are going to participate in the service today. Oh, it's you, you. Oh. Thank you so much for your participation. By the way, who is going to announce the offering? Oh, it is you? Do you know well what to say to the congregation? More or less, Pastor. Mm, that's not good. I say, do your best. But after you're speaking, tell the congregation that the pastor has something else to add. Why am I saying that? Why am I saying that? My last church in Brazil, the monthly tithes, it was about 250,000 US dollars. The offerings, $100,000 every month. I am not going to, 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 to allow any person with his low of tongue or stuttering to speak or to announce the offering in my church. Must be the best person. So that man came to the platform to the pulpit and say, now it's time to collect the offering. May God bless you. But the pastor has something else to say. Ah, I come with my speech, with passion. I tell my people, look, we are here to worship God. God has been so good. 
God has been blessing us in many ways. And today you have the opportunity to express gratitude, your love for God, uh, and, and to, to help this church in many ways. Not only the local church, the global church. So I make a kind of small sermon. Offering announcement should be like a small sermon. But we don't pay attention to these details. Anybody can announce in any way. And we say the church has no money. For sure. The church is a mirror of your leadership. Another point. Whoever goes to the platform must give an offering. And most of the time what I see is the greed people in the church, they are at the platform. Well, I teach my deacons, before you collect the offering in the congregation, it start with the platform. Because here is the model, here is the example. So one deacon came to the elder who had, let's be generous, blah, 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 during the offering announcement, and he gave nothing. Came to the church pastor, the church pastor was trying to find the sermon, he gave nothing. Came to another person, nothing. The deacon was so disappointed. He turned the plate upside down and he did this signal. Today here, we have no money. <laughs> if I am a church member, I see my pastor, elders, leaders giving nothing, I'm not going to give anything as well. I know that my commitment is with God, but we need to see good examples in the congregation. In my church, when I go to the pastoral room, I check the details. Who are those who are going with me to the platform? Thank you so much. Who is going to announce the offering? It's okay. If you need any help, please ask me. Uh, another question. Everybody here has offering? <laughs> and we start listening many kind of skills. Oh, pastor, I forgot my money uh, in the car. Don't worry. I give you some money. Ten, ten dollars you can give us an offering. After sunset, you pay me back. <laughs> I teach my members that it is a course to own money from the pastor. And some of them, even before sunset, they are paying me back. It's a blessing. Only one elder one day said, Pastor, I don't agree with you because I have a monthly plan. Oh, this is the ideal. If each church member has a monthly plan, the church is not going to face any financial problem. But I told that elder, when you come to the platform and everybody's giving offering, and you are the only one who is not giving, what the church members will think about you? A greed person? In order to help my people to be generous, every time that you come to the platform, could you give an extra offering? Okay, Pastor, if it's to help our church to be generous, every time that I come to the platform, I'm going to give an extra offering. But please, don't invite me to come every Sabbath to the platform. <laughs> it's okay, no problem. Another point, train the church deacons. The main responsibility in training deacons and deaconesses in the local congregation, it is, it's the pastor and the elders together. But we're not training them. There is a problem in our church. We think that election means qualification. Yeah, we're not training. We just say, brother, have been elected for this? If you have any question, call me. May God bless you. Bye. This is not training. Training is what we are doing here during these days. This is the reason why Ellen White says pastors preach less and train more. Because our people, they need to receive the right instructions. So, when we train people, don't, don't select shy deacons to collect the offerings. They are good to open the church door, to turn on the lights, to open the windows, but not for people contacts. When you select the deacons to collect the offerings, choose the best that you have. In other words, don't choose ugly people. In one church, 
the deacon was so ugly. When he started collecting the offerings, all children in the church started crying. <laughs> Avoid this kind of uncomfortable situation. I know that for God there is no ugly people, but for us it's different. <laughs> Let me justify my point here. I don't want to be misunderstood by you. What do I mean for, for ugly people? It's not the one that the nature didn't help him. When I talk about ugly people, I'm talking about the one who does not smile, who, does, who, who is not kind, who is not lovely in person. I grew up in this church. I was born in this church. And by the way, I teach how they could support you as a family in your congregation. God bless you.